then presumably at the end of the project, the shareholder will be happy. Right? notion here. And so when we look at future value, which perhaps is intuitively a little easier to, to get your minds around, this suggestion here is that this is a, a profitable project because it adds value to the company right now. Therefore, the shareholder should be wealthier at the end of the project in the year four. So if I take a future value of this, I indeed come up with a positive number, which really, and there's a couple of key notes you actually make it. That's not how wealthy the shareholder will be. That's how wealthy the shareholder will be on top of the opportunity cost investment, right? So remember, we're measuring our projects based on what the investor can do elsewhere, right? So at the very least, if they don't like our company, they're going to be able to take this $5,000, or $5 million, and invest it at 10% for four years. That's the baseline investment. This guy here is better by 2840. So yes, the investor gets the 10% return, but actually does better 2840 at the end. Okay. So that's the way to look at it. That's how much better the investor will be at the end uh, above the opportunity cost. And the other key point is that Look at these three investments. We talked about this last day. When cash comes in, we have to do something with it. And the assumption here is that if the time value money or the cost of capital here is 10%, that when that money comes in in year one, year two, year three, that we have a place to put it to grow it by at least 10%. If that's not the case, this term here says when that, say, million dollars comes in at the end of year one, we're going to grow it by 10% a year for the next three years. That's how we generate this wealth. Well, two ways of doing it. One, if it's a company that has good engineering projects that will pay at least 10%, then we take that million bucks and put it into those projects and it grows by 10%. If we're a company that's rather you know, old and has no opportunities, you know, shopping uh, malls, for example, or not shopping mall, but I would say a, a supermarket chain or something like that, they've got all the stores that they need, they're making lots of money, no place to invest. Well, maybe it's better to take that million dollars and give it to shareholders a dividend. Remember, they have the ability, by definition, to put that money away somewhere else at 10% and grow it by that. So the key thing here is this is shareholder value, whether or not the money is retained within the company for profitable projects, or whether or not it's paid out as dividends, and then the shareholders go away and invest it somewhere else and add 10%. Okay. So the key thing is, you know, we just don't sit on the money and put it under the mattress. It's constantly being reinvested. If it can't, at 10%, we pay it out as dividends. Okay. So just some arithmetic, but it's fairly powerful in terms of talking about, you know, how we value projects and how we look at cash flow. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. And also suggested to you that we're free to move sums of money around at the time, the time value of money. Okay, we have formulas that we're going to use, and sometimes the business situation doesn't lend itself well to those formulas, and also we move a few things around. All this is saying is that, you know, first of all, if I have a project which is at the positive present value, i.e. add value to the company, then I can easily say um, that it has uh, a greater value as far as shareholders are concerned at the end of the project. And I can move these sums of money around at my 10%. Okay, so, you know, if I had uh, a present value and I wanted to know future value, I don't have to take those individual cash flows at 10%. Just take the sum and move it forward uh, four periods at 10%. And vice versa, if I have future value and I want a present value, uh, I can do that just with the, the peak in there. Okay, so we can move things around fairly easily uh, to suit the needs of the situation. And we'll show you a few compound uh, problems where we have to do that as we move along uh, in the material. Well, what's happening here in this, all these symbols? Sometimes the details get lost in the symbols. And I often like to just slow down a little bit and say, well, what's really happening year by year to prove to you that indeed these formulas are giving uh, you, know, you um, accurately what's actually happening? So think about this as being a bank account, one way of handling it. And say I've got 10% interest either way. Okay, so if I owe money, I pay 10%. If I have a positive balance, I get 10%. We suggested that with the initial five million dollar, uh, sorry, five well, five thousand dollar, I'll just say five thousand, five thousand dollar investment, that the investor will be at the end of things twenty eight forty better off beyond the opportunity cost. What does that mean in words? Well, he will have gotten the five thousand back, 
He will have got interest on the money that's still owed him each year, and he's had 2840. That's what he needs to be better off by 2840 beyond the opportunity cost. Is that actually going to happen? Well, think about it. End of year zero, we take $5,000 off uh, out of this bank account, we borrow it, basically buy the piece of equipment. The cash is gone, right? We've got a piece of equipment that hopefully will generate those net cash. Flows. If that's the case, then think about during that first year how much we have to pay in terms of interest. Well, at 10%, $500. But we have 1000 coming in. So at the end of the year, it's 4500 the unrecovered balance of the investment. Which means we owe $4,500 for the entire year too, so we pay $450 on that interest. I think you get the idea. So each year, as the cash comes in, it's reducing the indebtedness and paying off the interest. And at the very end, there's $2,840 left over. Right, so the investor has got the $5,000 back. It's got 10% interest each year on the money that's still owed, and that's 2840. That's what it means to be a good investor. So the formulas are just a quick form of, of arriving at, at this number. So well, oftentimes we'll look at a bank account and just see how things work uh, in terms of uh, the various cash flows. Okay. Want to pull all this together to do a financial analysis? Uh, it's what I think we talked about uh, during our first uh, lecture or two. Just to suggest that everyone operates on the basis of money having a time value. It's just how best to pay uh, tuition. Uh, I've taken this out of the uh, faculty calendar, and you know, there's a fee of almost $10,000, and uh, there's a minimum first installment, and then there's a balance. Yeah. And what you can do is you can just you know, pay the first installment, then there's a service charge, or really it's interest at almost 20% of the year that kicks in, uh, and then you have to pay uh, in, in January. Okay. So I'd like to just look at this and see, well, what is the optimal strategy, i.e., which one has the less present value cost, okay. and where does that value come from? How is the difference between the strategies? Um, you know, the other ones have higher costs, but why is the optimal one at lowest cost? So I'd like to look at it from that point of view. Now, this is the second definition of a present value. In one case, we've got some future cash flows from saying how much value or how much shareholder value is created. Here, a student has obligations. So think about the present value as meaning what is the funded position or how much cash do I need right now, the time we're doing the present value, to meet those obligations. That's the second definition of a present value or second use Okay. So we're going to say, well, how much do we need initially uh, to fund these obligations using different strategies? Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to make a couple of simplifying assumptions. I'm going to have all the cash flows occurring at the end of the month and use a monthly interest rate. Um, for the exact number should need a daily interest rate, which is you know, not, much, uh, not, not much more difficult, but still it just messes up uh, my work on the board. So monthly interest rate with the cash flows occurring at the, at the end of every month. Okay, so let me, I'm going to just go to the board. So what I want to do is just talking through the, the steps, and no matter whether it's you know, tuition or, or whatever, financial analysis basically looks like that. One, I want to define the alternatives. Okay. So these are the feasible alternatives that achieve the same goal. Well, in this case, a student wants to be registered and takes five. So any payment stream that meets that is a feasible alternative uh, that it meets the objective. Then, since we're valuing things, remember there's two types of benefits in a project. One are the tangible cash flow ones. Those are the things we measure. And then there's the intangible, the fuzzies. We can't measure those. So what we normally do in engineering projects is we measure the tangible things and come up with a recommendation. And then we step back and consider some of the other intangibles to see whether or not we make a different decision. Okay. So here we generate cash flows. Well, once we have the cash flows, uh, then what's the time value money? I just use TBM, time value money. Okay. And then we need to consider, well, what's the valuation date? Because the cash flows and all the alternatives are different, we need to ask the question, well, what's the present value cost of tuition on a particular date? 
doesn't matter what date you choose, it's just you have to measure them all on the same day. So choose valuation. And then five, you actually do the valuation. And then I guess six, make recommendation. So I'd like to apply that process to our, our, um, our tuition example. Okay, first of all, let me define the alternatives. Well, the, the invoice comes in July, so pay July 1st. So you pay it as soon as you get it. So July 1st payment, and you're done. No more worries. Just like the one student who admitted to doing that because she always paid her bills and basically, you know, comes in, I pay it, who cares about it? Well, we'll see how much she's actually getting up as a result of that decision. Okay, <coughs> so, second alternative is, let's say, pay as late as possible, which is always a good strategy, and stay registered. And third is pay as late as possible, but no service charge. Okay. And there's other ones, but we'll focus in on these three. Okay. There's a suboptimal one that's a fourth one, which doesn't make much difference to what most people do, as I understand. Okay. So, three alternatives. They all basically meet the objective of uh, staying registered. What about the cash flows? Well, oftentimes just drawing the cash flow because time is so important is useful. Sometimes, you know, you get so used to doing this that you don't do it, but I'll do it here. Okay. So July 1st, option one, this is pay and you're done. That's the simplest of them all. Option two, the invoice comes in July, and you're going to basically in September make the first payment, which is 63.27. And then, because money has a time value, you're going to say, well, I'm going to wait as long as possible. Okay. And you're going to then stay registered, pay in January. And here, it's 34.08 plus a service charge. The third one is pay as late as possible but no service charge. Well, if you read the fine print, they don't start charging interest until October 15th. Okay. So, if I make this, and again, I'm just saying, you know, it's monthly interest and I'm just we're not worrying about half months here just to make the presentation a little easier. If I do this, I am going, a student's going to be able to be registered. Three, four. Okay. The calendar says, well, the interest rate uh, meter doesn't start until the end of October. So I've got now the, feas the feasible alternatives mapped out in terms of cash. Well, what's my next? Time value of money. Well, there are two different time values of money here. First of all, what's the opportunity cost for the student? Well, money in the bank, I guess. And so, if I look at the student's time value money, it's probably, for the sake of argument, around 3% a year. Yeah, maybe a little generous in terms of interest rates these days. These days, or per month. And we'll show you the formulas for compound interest a little later on. So take it for granted, a quarter percent per month. Student's time value money. So if a student has surplus cash, that's how much it's going to generate each month at the end of each month. Okay. Now of course, U of T, our service charge. Well, that happens to be 1.5% per month. 
obviously we don't like lending money to students or there's a risk factor in there since students uh, sometimes are bad, uh, bad credit risk. Okay. I think that's it. There's a risk premium in there. We talked about risk premiums and bad debt. Okay. okay, so I've got time value money now. And so what I want to do is choose evaluation date. And again, I can do it at any time. September 1, maybe at the end, future value of January. But I'm going to choose, like we do things in engineering projects, <laughs> right now. Where right now is when the invoice comes in. Okay. And so my valuation date, July 1. Okay. And what I'm asking is, what is the present value cost of tuition on July 1st? So it's a present value cost. Again, think about it as how much money do I need? What's my fund disposition necessary to meet the obligation in those three uh, payment streams? Okay, that's what present value is from this point of view. So it's basically funding position. How much cash does the student need? Okay, so this basically defines the entire problem. And now all we have to do is evaluation. Well, this is the easiest one. Present value cost on July 1, well, 97.35. That's what it costs. So if I have 97.35, I pay the tuition, I have nothing left, and I'm done for the year. Now, the second one is a little more difficult. Again, I want to find out what's the present value on July 1st. That's my valuation date. But I've got cash flows in the future. And to further complicate it, I've got two interest rates that could possibly apply. So I've got October, I've got November, and I've got December. Okay. So let's, first of all, determine this term here. Okay. In other words, I've got to pay for a student has to pay 3408 okay, and a service charge. Well the way to look at that is it's a future value, right? It's an obligation and interest is being charged. Therefore the compound factor has to be greater than one. Right. I want to have to give I want the future value of the sum of money given that I'm going to owe some money with interest in the future. Well, one way of handling it is to first of all ask the question, well, when does the interest meter start? The interest meter starts at the end of October. So interest, and this is just what it says in the faculty calendar, interest charge in this period. So if I pay only 30, uh, 63.27, it means on this day, I still owe 3408. <coughs> so I owe 3408 here, but no interest. So here for one, two, three periods, I've got three compounding periods of interest. That's F given P. And so the way of looking at the interest charge then is going to be that. I owe 3408, F given P. Again, I paid 63.27, I owe 34.08, and the interest is charged for three months. So I want the future value at, um, oh, that's wrong, isn't it? That's right, because this, the university charges the student 1.5%. Okay, and I think I have a number. So the number for this is 35.46. The way to look at it is, on January 1st, the student needs $3,546 to meet the payment of interest. <coughs> but I'm valuing it here. <coughs> so doesn't that mean that the student needs less money on July 1st because of the ability to earn interest? Okay. Well, how much interest? Okay. Well, let me put a bracket around this. So this is now the Jan, this is the Jan one payment. Well, isn't there one, two, 
three, four, five, six time periods for the student's money to grow before that obligation has to be met. Right? So if there's a sum of money that the student's putting aside on July 1st, it has six time periods. Now, of course, the student's not going to earn 1.5, the bank's only paying 0.25. So I'm asking the question, what is the present value, or how much cash does the student need on July 1st to meet that obligation six months from now? Well, the dollar amount is this. And so am I not simply asking for P given F 0.25% comma 6? That's how much money the student needs here to be able to pay 3408 plus a service charge. This is the most difficult one in this example. Part of the example. Okay. So with that number, it'll grow over six months to meet the requirement of 3546. There's another part to this. 366327. Well, how much money does the student need? Well, P given F, 2.5%, I'm going to argue 2, right? Because here, there's two time periods, okay? and 63.7. Okay. So it's always best to use the symbol rather than just numbers uh, and equations. Right. Of course, um, well, these numbers are not in the back of the textbook because they're not integers. You have to use the formulas to calculate them. <coughs> but your presentation, especially on a quiz, is better this way. And work through the numbers. 9806. Which suggests that waiting to pay is more expensive than paying now. We try to run counter to this current value of money, saying he had his long long far out in the future as possible. Well, what's falling down here, of course, is that effectively a student is um, borrowing money at 1.5% to save it at 0.25%. Not a very economic proposition. That is, this number. So, strategy two has a higher present value cost than strategy one simply came on the offer. Now, the next one is a little simpler. Again, what I want to do, I want to do present value July. Okay. Well, similarly, I've got two payments. This first one here is just like this one here. It's 327. P given F. Students time value money comes two. And I've got one additional period here. So it's 3408. Now this number is interesting. 9678. It is less than paying right away, <coughs> which stands to reason, because the money staying with the student is basically earning interest. Whereas if it's paid here, it would be the university earning that interest before. Okay, so the time value money is working for the student. Make sense? Okay. So the optimal strategy then appears to be this. Is that the way many people pay their tuition? Or many people will simply pay their tuition the entire thing on September 1st and forego one month's interest. And here we have an intangible factor. The convenience of just getting it done versus 0.25% of 3408, which isn't an awful lot of money. Right? So the fourth strategy is suboptimal economically, but the intangible or you know, fuzzy, fuzzy values of just getting it done, and so what I lose 0.25% of 3408 doesn't matter. Okay, so fourth strategy then would be that, and probably what most people did. And of course, the university then has all this money for an extra month, which adds up for the university. Okay, okay. let's now see why this has such a difference. Where does that come from? 
Well, it comes from the time value of money working for, for the student. And I'm just going to go to my... Uh, I've got this worked out for you, so let's have a look. And then 
hopefully in the first few years, I don't have to buy an awful lot of parts, and as I get older, I've got to buy more parts. And then presumably at the end of the year, end of the project, when I get rid of the equipment, I've got some residual value of the test equipment, and I've got some spare parts left over. Okay. This is the present value cost of in-house maintenance. Or I can say, well, I'm going to go to a vendor, and they're going to quote me a five-year maintenance contract, which basically looks like this. And they'll fix it. Well, which one's better? What's the present value analysis? So I can use the annuity formula and just figure out what's the present value cost of this. So this is contracting, so contract maintenance. So we use the term outsource or in-house. So this formula will tell me what the present value cost of this, and this formula will tell me the pre or so the present values we've talked about will tell us what the present value of that is. The lower present value of cost, of course, is the one that is lower. What about if the present value cost of um, this one is slightly less than that one? Okay. So there's a maybe in a hundred thousand dollar contract, this one may be one thousand dollars more expensive. Well, the economic answer is thus. What intangible answer the questions might be made? Well, do I really want to maintain this in house and have all of the headaches of having to worry about my in house by myself? Or for a thousand dollars, is the fact that someone will do everything and have the inventory and fix it and whatever um, and will be done, is that worth it? So, some intangible considerations may suggest that going outside makes more sense. Then, on the flip side, perhaps having control and having it in doing the in-house is a better service. So once you do the economic analysis, there's a bunch of intangible factors because they're not going to be exactly the same that might determine one way or the other what you do. Okay. But you've got to start out with the you know, economic. So if this thing's $50,000, that's cheaper, then you're not going to do any intangibles. You're just going to go with that. Also, you might look at what you're paying your tax. You're probably paying too much to do that. Yeah. But anyway, okay, so this is the uniform series. What you need is three conditions. You need, obviously, to have the same amount okay, each time. You need to have a cash flow at the end of every time period. And the formula will value all of that one time period before the first cash flow. If you have those three conditions, you can use uh, the uniform series of uh, annuity series. All we're saying is that we're doing a present value. Because remember, this is nothing more than A, P given F, I comma 1. I comma two, I comma three, and <coughs> it so happens uh, to uh, basically, you know, you can solve this for a, a, a uniform, for a closed form here, and you can basically uh, just very easily figure out what it is. Back to the textbook has all of these things calculated out for integer uh, values of interest, and so what we say is, well, I want the present value of an annuity, I want P given A, present value of an annuity, and time period, I interest rate per period uh, on a K cash flow, which is the same. Other use of annuities is in the financial sector, okay, where um, perhaps um, if you're looking at generating uh, cash flow, let's say at retirement, you want to have so many dollars per year. Well, this is one way of figuring out, well, how much money do I need up front to get an investment firm uh, to basically generate uh, so much cash each year? Okay. And then there's uh, variations on that, which include life insurance um, to let you know it's fixed uh, for life. Okay. So those sorts of um, Financial analyses are of themselves as well to use the uniform series as well. Okay. Well, let me give you a um, simple example here. Okay. First of all, we have a cash flow at the end of every time period. The cash flow is the same. And I'm asking the question how much money do I need one time period before the first cash flow to fund that? Okay. So think about, um, well, in this case here, I'm looking at it from the point of view of um, positive cash flows, but what's that equivalent to today? What, what value is there? Well, very easily, I'm going to say I, go, I want the present value of an annuity since it's in the perfect form. I've got a 7% interest rate, five time periods, and $2,000. Which suggests that this has, if this were a project generating $2,000 a year for the next five years, I've got $8,200 worth of value. 
basically that, that's what it is. Now, let's just say that I can't use the formula directly. Okay, and this is where I come back to moving some of the money around uh, based on um, the needs of the problem. Let's say I need five $2,000 um, cash flows, but I need them starting at the end of year, uh, year three. So I don't need them right now. Well, the easiest thing to do is to have an intermediate valuation block. We know that the formula for an annuity will give us the value one time period before the end of year two. Okay, but we're asking the question, how much do we set aside at the end of year zero? Well, that simply means that I've got two extra years for the money to grow. So what about if I put enough money here to grow two years to generate 8,200, and then I can use the formula? So this is an example of a sort of a compound problem where you want to use the formula because it's easier in terms of calculation, but it's not quite set up the way the business case is. So here, we basically recognize that by saying, well, let's have that intermediate point end of year two. I can use P given A, and then I just determine how much money I need now uh, using a P given F. So if I have 7162, it will grow to 8200 in two years. And that, from the previous work, is enough to fund those uh, five things. <coughs> okay. So you know, again, the three periods, and I just be given a, a, a double percent comment. Okay. The key thing, of course, is if I want to use the formula for valuation, it has to meet those three conditions. Very useful formula, and then it comes up a fair bit. And there's really four <coughs> different types of analysis that we're going to run across in this course. We've talked about present value right now. There's something called a capital recovery factor. So think about if I have a machine that has a value of P. Okay, so it's you know, $10,000 machine. And I want to ask the question, well, how much do I need to recover each year? when I consider the loss of capital, in other words, spread the P payment out, as well as the interest that I've got tied up on the money that I've got invested. So we'll come back to that. So this is a way of helping us set a rate, again, based on a piece of equipment that we want to make sure that we're charging back each other. Okay. Then we have some future-oriented ones. Um, in terms of uh, uh, this one here, the sinking funds, basically I want um, to have a target, and periods from now, how much do I have to put aside in this? And similarly, if I put aside so much each year, what's the future value? Just a um, key point here in terms of using the formulas correctly. With P given A, it's always doing the valuation one time period before. <coughs> and you just have to, uh, these are things you have to memorize to those the way the formulas work. With F given A, it's slightly different. <coughs> F given A will value the cash flows one microsecond after the last cash flow. So think about it as the last cash flow comes in, F given A tells me what it's worth just after that cash flow comes in. You know, one time period out. That's just the way the formula works. Okay. So just keep that in mind because if you, know, if you say P given A values it here, well, you're going to get a different number. And the geometric and the gradients all have their uh, work between the dots. So what I'd like to do is use um, one of these formulas uh, to help us um, figure out uh, another financial problem. And this is one that perhaps uh, many of you wish that your parents had sort of thought about uh, maybe 20 years or so ago. Set aside a little bit of money, and then of course you'd be on an easy street right now. Hopefully, some of your parents have done that for you. Issue is. Well, a bunch of issues, really. How much money? Okay. And then, since it's a long period of time, how do I go about thinking about, well, how much is tuition going to cost? And of course, what are interest rates going to be? Right. So that money earns each year. <coughs> then I want to talk a little bit about the value of money. What's the pain, as far as the family is concerned, of doing this? And does that pain change over time? So think about that as we're going through, because I mean, just a arithmetic, but the issues surrounding it is much more, are much more important. So let's just say that, you know, um, September 1990, and uh, it's expected that enrollment will start in September 2009. So there's 20 time periods for which to invest. And what the parents want to do is just set aside a little bit of money each year so that um, there's a tuition available. 
Now, they're going to say, well, we think four years of tuition, you know, this is a 20-year projection, is $30,000. And they also think that the average interest rate will be 7%. So as they put the money in, basically 7% is what it's growing at each year. And of course, if either of these numbers are wrong, well, there's either too much money, or more than likely, too little money to go to school. Now you might say, well, isn't that impossible? Well, it, it is to get it correct, but think about the nature of inflation. And again, inflation, which we'll formally introduce in this chapter as well, uh, really changes the prices of everything, and it really has a sort of self-correcting effect on this. Okay. We talked about interest. Okay. This 7% is what investors are demanding. And remember, there was a number of components that went in there. One of them was inflation. And so, in this 7%, there's probably, just from sort of uh, ex expectations, an assumption that there's 4% inflation, 4 to 5% inflation over this time period, or else interest rates would be low. Okay. So, if there's a, let's say, 5% implicit interest uh, inflation rate in there, it means people are earning 2% real, then it means that general prices are going up by 5%. <coughs> but doesn't the cost of education more or less, well actually it goes more than less, it goes up each year than inflation. Okay. And so if the parents knew what a college education would cost in 1990, inflated by 5% a year, that's where they get the 30%. Or inflated, really what's actually happening is inflation plus 1%. Inflated by 6%, you'll get that number. Okay. Now what about if the estimate's wrong? Well, isn't it self-correcting? Let's say inflation happens to be low. Well, first thing, cost of education is going to be lower, but this interest rate is going to be lower. Right? So denominator <coughs> and numerator both going down, self-correcting. Similarly, let's say that inflation is much higher, so it costs thirty-five or forty thousand dollars to go to school. Well, more than likely, this interest rate will be higher. It will generate more money. So it really is somewhat self-corrected. And what we do in engineering projects is we take inflation totally out of it. If we assume projects are inflation neutral, we use an interest rate that has no inflation, and we don't try to account for price increases before we like for our projects. That's really what this is recognized. So it's self-corrected. Okay, so if I want to now come up with a numeric uh, example here, well, September 2009 is the time of the last payment, and that's when the 30000 is required. So again, my future value, I'm giving an annuity payment of so much uh, each year, values it right after the cash flow. So this formula can be directly used okay, to figure out how much money I need just after the last payment, September 2009, just before the 30000 is required to go to school. Okay. Well, it's 30000 I want A given F, 7% common 20. That number is in the back of the textbook, so very simply you lift <coughs> 0244 out of the back of the textbook, and it's $732 per year. <coughs> so from here, $732 per year, tuition would be free. And there are now tax-free savings plans, which there were 20 years ago, that actually allow parents to save a little bit on taxes as well, and not pay taxes on this as it grows. Okay, now let me ask the question. What about putting $732 aside? Will that impact a family differently over the beginning of the planning period versus the end of the planning period? Or $732 and $732 aside? Think about how wages have increased over 20 years. They more or less keep up with inflation. So it was much harder for a family in the early 1990s, perhaps with a family income of 40000 setting aside $732 a year, because that was a percentage-wise a fairly large number, which discouraged many families from doing that, versus perhaps now where the wages might be, you know, family wage might be you know, $75,000, 80000 with, with uh, both um, spouses working. <coughs> 732 is not nearly as, as a difficult number to deal with. So this number stays constant, 
but its value for its purchasing power becomes less each year due to inflation. In over 20 years, it's a huge difference. You could buy an awful lot more for $732 in 1990 uh, than in 2009 because those inflation charts that I showed you uh, back in Chapter 2. So over time, 732 becomes much easier for a family to come up with simply because the money itself is worth less each year. And conversely, uh, the rate, the wages are going up. Okay. Now, I want to just give you one more example here. I'm going to take the time. Okay. I want to just show you uh, how uh, we can uh, change the problem a little bit and turn it into a compound interest problem. Um, for a compound a step problem, and then there's more than one step. So, this suggests that the parents are going to give their son or daughter $30,000 when they're you know, just uh, coming to school as a first year. Now, many students, I mean, they certainly trust their son or daughter, but definitely not with $30,000. You never know what they're going to do. So what about if the parents say, well, you know, we're going to keep that money and we'll throw out $7,500 a year. So that's what you need uh, per year. Well, that becomes a slightly different problem in that the time value money is going to be working for the parents over those four years rather than the student. Because if the student had the 30 grand, assuming you know, they put it in the bank and, and earn interest, uh, it would work for them. So it would suggest that if the parents said, okay, we're only going to give you $7,500 a year, that they're going to need less money each year, right? Because there's added value in terms of delaying those payments. And how would that work? Well, essentially, they're going to need an amount of money they're going to need an amount of money at the time of the last payment. So the payments are going to be this. <coughs> okay, where this is 2009, <coughs> 10, 11, and 12. Okay. First step is to ask the question, well, how much money do they need <coughs> to fund this position? Okay. And remember, the first payment occurs here. Well, this looks like an annuity, right? And so the first step at it is 7,500. If you give an A, 7% on the full. Now, interesting thing is that remember what this formula tells me in terms of valuation. One time period before. So if I just use this formula by itself, isn't it telling me how much money the parents need one time period before? What I really need to know is how much money do the parents need at the time of the last deposit in 2009 because that's my thinking fund formula. So I've got to do some adjustments. Okay. What do I have to do? Well, I could do one of two things. Okay, first of all, is that, that okay? Because here, in this, form, in this example, I'm asking the question, my target is at September 2009, one time period, or sorry, at the time I need the 30,000. Here, I need to know right here how much money they need. Okay, but this formula tells me right here. Well, one approach is to say, well, if this formula tells me present value 2008, and I need present value 2009, well, why not just move it forward one time period? F given D, 7% comma 1, times all of this. That then tells me how much the parents need in September 2009. Alternatively, I could look at this and say, let me break it up into two um, series of cash flows. If I take these three cash flows, I have something that looks like this. In given A, I've got 7% um, comma 3. That tells me the value of these cash flows right here. And then I've got this one. That's the other way of doing it. Okay. So again, the business situation doesn't lend itself to the direct use of the formulas, and so I have to improvise. Okay. And, the improv and there's a couple of ways of doing it, as in many problems. Okay. Okay. 
I'll take some time, uh, first thing, uh, next lecture, and just we'll go over this again, because uh, it's sort of important to realize the limitations of, of the equation just to make sure that you're valuing it at the right time, or else you wouldn't get the right answer. Never forget that. Thanks. Show 下午呢,我上課,你拿放上課。拜拜。